to share a message. And so um, to those, I just came off stage. Sorry about that. My name is Katie. I'm a second year student at Karis Bible College. Hello. And so I'm super excited to share this message because um, when it comes to just uh, ministering, you know, God's love to people, ministering. I work at the phone center, um, and when I used to be on the phones uh, consistently, I would always kind of gravitate to this topic just because I know the Lord has um, taken me on this journey of understanding again and revelation of my identity in Christ. So whenever I get the opportunity to share it with people, I'm on it. Like, I'm, I'm ready to share that. And so... Um, I just wanted to provide a little backstory. I remember when I was in high school and I was doing all sorts of things. I didn't even know, <laughs> I didn't even know what happiness was. Depression, anxiety were just gripping me and I didn't know those were the terms until a youth pastor had told me, Katie, um, this is what it is. And I was like, oh. But at that moment, I, I was like, I can't deal with this for the rest of my life. That's not what the Lord called me to do. However, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what I was missing. I grew up in church. I went to church every Sunday, went to youth group, started in high school. I was always involved in church. However, I still didn't know who I was in Christ. I'm not really sure what happened when I said yes to Jesus when I was eight years old. I just didn't want to go to hell. So I said yes to the Lord. I was like, yes. And I said it over and over every time the pastor was like, hey, who wants to give their life? My hand went up, even though I did it last Sunday. And for years and years, I kept doing that. So, fast forward to high school, I was sitting in my piano teacher's bedroom. She was getting ready to go to Mozambique to minister the gospel. And she sat me in her bed and she was like, Katie, the Lord sees you as a royal diadem in his hand. And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, no, he doesn't. And he was like, yes. And she showed me the scripture in Isaiah. And that stuck with me. And it's so funny, the Lord has just taken that and even just reminded me of that in subtle ways. A year ago, I was at a Daughter of the King uh, meeting, and a lady had come up to me and prophesied over me. I was just like, Katie, I see you standing before the Lord, and he's giving you a diadem. And I was just like, I know the scripture. I already know. It's an Isaiah. I was like, thank you, Jesus, for that reminder. So I'm super passionate about identity because it's knowing our identity that, you know, like you had talked about the deception of the enemy. He's going to try and come at your identity, come at what you know of the nature of God, cause you to doubt, cause you to fear. But, you know, I just tell the enemy, I'm a daughter of God. I know I'm going. I'm going to be right there with him. You, on the other hand, uh, well, your destiny doesn't look so bright. And I love just going in and just sharing. And just like we talked about with Rick Renner this week, humiliate the devil. And I just kind of flip it on him. You can't come at my identity because I know where I am in Christ Jesus. And so, so to start this off, we're going to talk about an interesting character in the Bible whom, if I had saw him walking down the streets here, I probably would have crossed over and gone a different direction because he was quite, quite the character. And that was John the Baptist. You know, he ate locusts. You know, he was in the desert. I'm not sure if he was the most sightly man <laughs> in the Bible, but yet he was very powerful in making the way of the Lord. In the Gospel of John, the question is declared onto John the Baptist by the Pharisees who were the religious leaders of that day. And there was a question that was asked. That question was, who are you? that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? That's John chapter 1, verse 22. This question has brought forth after a series of other questions that were asked as the Pharisees were trying to figure out who was this John and why was he speaking with so much authority? In John chapter 1, verse 23, John the Baptist confidently answers, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. The words that flowed out of his lips were from the book or the scroll at that time of Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 40. And I remember reading this in the summer, and I was just like, why is this highlighted? This is one of the, I mean, I used to read this all the time, and I didn't, didn't see the power behind the statement. John the Baptist knew who he was, and because he knew what he was, he was able to operate in his purpose confidently. How did John the Baptist know this, though? How did John find this information? And we know that... They did not have bound Bibles back then. They had scrolls with just endless words. They didn't have, they broke it down into chapters and verses. So to me, I was just like, God, how in the world did he find this specifically about him? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, and he answered, through being enlightened by the Holy Ghost as he was meditating through the scriptures of what we call now the Old Testament. John already had the indwelling of the Holy Ghost as the Gospel of Luke indicates. In the beginning of Luke, going back a bit, 
it opens up to Zacharias, who was the priest in his day. Being visited by the angel of the Lord, he was told that he and Elizabeth, who was barren and well advanced in her years, would bear a son and call him John, and that he will be filled with the Holy Ghost. We find that in Luke 1.15 when it says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And then this actually takes place when Mary goes to um, her cousin Elizabeth, when I believe Mary was three months pregnant, Elizabeth six months. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, verse 41, it says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So powerful. I was like, yes. It's being enlightened by the Holy Ghost that John the Baptist knew exactly who he was, and he was able to go forth boldly and be unshaken. So, I'm going to flip this question on you. What do you say about yourself? When people ask, who are you? In the Western culture, it's so easy to equate our identity with what we can do. Oh, I'm a plumber. I'm a prayer minister. I'm a teacher of the word. I'm this. I'm that. But that's not what the Lord defines you as. When we're asked, what do you say about yourself? Usually, I feel my identity challenged when something is happening. Like when the enemy is, uh, enemy is trying to attack or a lie has been presented or I have the choice to believe something or lean back on the word of God. The question struck me in such a way that it reminded me of the potential there is to walk confidently in the identity that Christ provided for me to live in. If I'm asked this question, where does my mind immediately go to? Knowing about your identity and walking your identity are two different things. It's not something we utter out, it's something we live by faith, just like we live our salvation. And as believers, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit like John the Baptist has, whose sole purpose is to point us back to Jesus every single day. As Jesus is, so are we. And often, like I said before, we're more aware of what the world is telling us. So much more aware than what our Creator has declared over us. Becoming hardened to the Word of God truly says about us and being more sensitive to the world, more sensitive to man-made identities, more sensitive to works mentality, which is a religious mindset, more sensitive to what we can do for Christ instead of resting in Christ has done for us. That is where I found myself stuck. I was the person that would be at church from morning till night, just working, 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 not realizing that I was just trying to earn something from God. But that's not true. Right. That I serve the Lord and I serve his people through my relationship with him, by yes. abiding in him. Yes. And that's what we're going to go into next. Come on. The first step into walking in our identity, living our identity, is accepting what he did on the cross, and then secondly, abiding in him. The truth is is that you are made righteous because accepting what Jesus Christ did, because of the finished work of the cross, that Jesus, born through the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, was perfect in every way, bore all of our sicknesses and sins, died a criminal's death, was buried, but on the third day, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead through the power of the Holy Ghost, ascended into heaven. It's because of Jesus Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we are saved from the devil's hell. We're established in relationship with him. We're reunited, reconciled, rejoined to God. We are made new carriers of the Spirit of God, infused with supernatural power and the resurrection life. That is who you are in Christ Jesus. That is the truth that you stand on, no matter what happens on here on earth, no matter what the media is telling us, no matter what people are telling no matter what other Christians are telling you, you know, we are all in this process of growing in the Lord. Yeah. And I pray for our brothers and sisters around the world that yeah. they will continue to be enlightened to their identity in Christ. Can you imagine when we're actually one? We're an unstoppable force. When we know who we are in Christ as one church, one body, one bride for Christ. Yes, uh, yes I'm so excited for that. Yes. Secondly, I had mentioned abiding in him. Our Christ identity is rooted in being in relationship with God, continual relationship with God. Because it's not in the doing and trying, it's in the being and becoming. In John 15, 4, verse, uh, John 15, 4, verses 4 through 5, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye accept you abide in me. Ooh, that's King James. I'm going to read over here. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, or for without me you can do nothing. So I did a little study on two words, abide and in. So uh, to abide means to remain in reference to a place, to sojourn, to tarry, not to depart, to continue to be present, to be held, kept continually. Abide in the Strong's definition is the primary verb. It's to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. Other words are to continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand, and so on. Going back to how abide is a verb, it's a constant thing. It's something that we're always doing. It's not just, oh, thank you, Jesus, for um, saving me. That's it. No. It's every day we seek the face of God. Going to in. In is a primary preposition, and it's denoting a fixed position in place, time, or state. In Strong's, it says it's locally or place proper, and it's, it's within that space of abiding. So when we say abide in, in Christ, we're fixed in him. Yeah. And it's so powerful. It's so powerful when we spend time in anyone's presence. Let's say I'm hanging out with Brian, hanging out with um, Debbie, hanging out with Reg and, and Melody. I'm going to begin to talk with you. After a couple months, I'll begin to talk like y'all. Yeah. I'll begin to say the same jokes. I'll begin to understand what you guys do. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'll begin to just talk like them and act like them. I have a friend, um, and <laughs> he's an LSU fan. Listen, I am not. I do not care about football. I, I'm here for the food. I'm here for the commercials for Super Bowl. I'll be honest. So I'm just then, and I'm the bandwagon. Whoever's winning, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm for the team. And so um, he's an LSU fan, and I wasn't really a big fan of college football. But I began hanging out with him a lot. All of a sudden, I'm just like, uh, the LSU, uh, they, they won a game, and I started to root for them. I was like, wait, what am I doing? I was like, where's my LSU gear? I need all of that. You know, I began to talk like him. I'm just like, what is going on? And he knows he's an influencer. He, every, every time he's around people, people tend to yeah. gravitate to what he likes to do. And so, and I just saw that, man, if I'm spending time, as I'm spending time with the Father, I begin to talk like yeah. God. I get to speak like God. I got to think like God. You know, I got to, we have to laugh at our jokes together. You know, I want to spend time in his presence. Yeah. There's a story in um, a, a Exodus with uh Moses going up to Mount Sinai for 40 days, and then he came down the mountain, and like the Israelites were like, you got to cover your face because you're shining too much of his presence. And I'm like, God, I want to know when I'm, I'm out in public, when I'm out in the world, that I'm shining yes. too much of your presence. I'm exuding Christ wherever I go because of my relationship with you. I don't have to try and do this. I just have to be. Yes. That's right. And the fruitfulness come. Another important aspect of this understanding our identity and walking in it is meditation. Through renewing your mind, you need to know that you already have the Spirit of God within you. Therefore, you also carry His nature. This is not something we're trying to gain. This is not trying, something I'm trying to reach up and get. This is something that's within me, and I have to discover. That was the issue all those years of being saved and not knowing who I was. I wasn't renewing my mind. I was just being a typical Christian and going to school, being a kid, being a teenager, doing the things I just normally did, and then Christ was a part of that. But now... That's not, the, that's not the same anymore. I can't go back there Amen. because I know. I know the power. I know the authority of God. And I'm, every single day we're growing and renewing our mind as we spend time. Romans 12, 1 uh, and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We need to delve deep into the Word and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, just like the Holy Spirit taught John the Baptist. Highlight to us and enlighten us with the Word. The attended purpose is not for us to read through and just try to memorize what we already, you know, are in Christ. Emphasis already are because these are all these are all things that are within us because of our born again nature. Yes. The purpose and heart is to bring us to our knowing that established in us being a born again believer are the fruits of the spirit, righteousness of God, that we are fully sanctified, that the enemy flees from you when you resist him, and yes. so on and so on. Yes. I mean to think about that. We don't really have to do much of anything. All we gotta do is like resist the enemy, and he runs away. 
And I start to think, God, what, what is in the inside of us? I want an image. And there's a verse that talks about when we see him, we will also see ourselves. And I'm just like, I want to know what that is now here through the renewed of my mind and transform the word. Psalm 19, uh, whoa. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Yeah. Psalm 19, 14, a couple of verses down says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Yeah. In Josh and Josh in Joshua chapter one, verse eight, I believe, it talks about how day and night will meditate on the word. And at first when you read that verse, it's like, how in the world am I supposed to be meditating the word twenty four hours? But then again, when we meditation is just it's the exact same thing when we worry. We're meditating on something. And so it's more so that discipline of instead of meditating on the worry, you meditate on what the Lord has promised you and guaranteed you. The Lord had reminded me of that last night. It's like, I have put my word in you. You know, I am healed. I am whole. I am restored. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to dream about that. I'm going to see myself that. No matter what happens, I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to be unshakable in Christ Jesus. And so in those three things, accepting, abiding, and also meditating, we begin to know and understand our identity. And I find this so important in our world today. Our identity is challenged by media, by variety of things that we're seeing on the news. And I don't even have to name any of them. A couple comes to your mind already when we think about what people are defining identity as. I feel like the definition of identity changes every year. But the word of God doesn't. And we are called to, to live our lives according to that. And I believe that you know, as we begin to walk boldly and confidently in that, we get to exude Christ to the world. People are going to see yeah. a different type. People are going to begin to wonder, what is this? But yes, we're a chosen generation. We're a peculiar people. Yes, we are king, daughters. Oh, we are kings and queens of the kingdom. Yes, I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of the king. Yeah. You know, yes, my life represents Christ. This is what Christ likeness is. And so, going back to John the Baptist, again, he knew exactly who he was and he lived it out. And he wasn't threatened when Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized because he knew and was established with his purpose here on earth, with who he was. This is also seen in John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. And it says, And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptized, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent forth before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must decrease, increase, and I must increase. De whoa. Sorry. He must increase, but I must decrease. I love that no matter what, John the Baptist was not challenged in his identity because he was so deeply rooted in who he was, nothing can uplift him. No circumstance on this earth can uplift him. No circumstance on this earth can uplift you. He's already promised that over you, that he loves you with everlasting love. There's nothing that we can do or not do to change that. So as we begin to understand this, that we're so securely rooted in his heart, we can walk boldly in this earth. We can walk boldly at Walmart, walk boldly wherever you are in Woodland Park, Colorado Springs, Colorado, or wherever the Lord sends you next after this place. Just know that your identity in Christ will always remain. It doesn't matter if the earth or the world is moving around you, that we can stand unshakable, unnerved, and unmoved, and confident in the Lord and exude Christ. And so... I, if you're here today and yet you do not have a relationship with God, I want to encourage you to make that decision. Because in Him and in everything we've been talking about today is abundant life. This is eternal life that we may know Him. Not just, you know, eternity as then we leave our earthen vessels and go to heaven. You know, that's, that's, that's where we're going. That's our destination. But that's not the, all the purpose of salvation here. Because we can live that eternal life here on earth. 
Jesus Christ saw you, he saw me, and chose to die for the iniquities, the sins of this world, so that through accepting what he did on the cross, we can be made forever sanctified, reconciled unto God. Isn't it so cool that from the beginning of time, that's all God wanted, a relationship with you. That's all he wanted, that love relationship with you. There's a, um, there's a writer of a book, and I can't remember the title, but it was describing the communion of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. And how it, out of the overflow of that relationship, they're like, we need to share this with, with this. And they started, that's when they started creating humans. No, it's not found in scripture. But that image of just the communion of those three, that the love for one another, they're like, I want, I want Katie to be a part of that. You know, I want Melody to be a part of that. I want Rachel to be a part of that. And then he created us just so that we could be a part of that love relationship. And that in turn, we let his love flow through us into this world. We get to walk in his righteousness and his perfection and not our own. Because he loves you with an everlasting love that knows no beginning or end. It's a simple yet powerful yes. And if, is there anyone here who would want to give their life to the Lord? I know that every Sunday Andy says that we don't want to assume everyone is saved here. And we do welcome you know, those who want to make that stuff today, that we wanted you to join our family because it's pretty fantastic being part of the body of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then another powerful aspect of our walk with the Lord is that, you know, we get to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's like the activation of the Holy Ghost that we were talking about here with John the Baptist that gives you that power and authority. When I was 16, I was pulled into a room with a girl and two guys. They, we held hands and they prayed for us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. From that day, y'all, the relationship went to a whole other level. The power and authority, I couldn't stop thinking of ministry. I'm like, God, we have to. We have to just go. We have to go do things. We have to advance the kingdom of God. This insatiable desire to just continue to minister just started to rise up within me. I became hungry for the word. The word of God came alive in a way it did not. I read scriptures before, when I, before I was 16, the Bible was pretty dry. I was just like, ah, this is just, this is, I'm just reading out of routine. After getting baptized, I was like, I can't get enough. I have to get this within me. And so if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's a beautiful gift. It's a good gift that the Father has given on to us. And it will prepare you for the work that the Lord has, has for you. With baptism in baptism the Holy Spirit, you have the gift of speaking in tongues. And yes, your mind might think it's foolishness, but that's okay. Um, because it's a heavenly language and you're speaking spirit to spirit. And so if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet, you are more than welcome to come up and we will pray over you for you to receive that baptism in the Holy Spirit. Again, we don't want to assume the same thing with salvation. We always want to do this every Sunday to have that invitation. And um, if you don't want to come up right now, but you want to come up later, I'll be up here for a couple minutes and we'll, we can pray and get you set up with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right. Okay. So wrapping all this up, you know, God is so good and he is so faithful and he is so patient with us. And he'll take each and every single moment, every single baby step with you and show you and teach you and lead you and guide you. Walking in identity is not just something we're going to walk up out of this church today and be like, okay, I got it. It's something that you're going to have to walk through every single day and know that, that in you is that perfect spirit, the righteousness of God, that there's no guilt and condemnation in Christ Jesus, Amen. that he loves you with everlasting love. That you're holy, sanctified, sacred, chosen, a peculiar generation. But God is good. And he will lead you and guide you. And I encourage you that wherever you are, whether you're going back to work, going home today, whatever it is, that you remember your identity in Christ and let that flow in and through you. And watch as you just see the goodness of God just impact people's lives with you just being yourself in him. And Christ will work through you. And so if you wouldn't mind, join me in prayer. I can go ahead and pray this out. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for your goodness, God. I thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful God. Thank you for giving us examples in the word. Like John the Baptist, like Moses, Lord God, like you yourself, Jesus. Of being unmovable, unshakable in their identity. 
God, I thank you that you're in us. It's Christ in us. That's our identity. That's all our identity is, Christ in us. We are a new creation, a new nature. And God, as we're walking where God in this, as we're actively moving, actively abiding, actively meditating on your word, God, that you continue to bring these scriptures alive to us, enlighten our hearts, enlighten our eyes, as we begin to see what it looks like in the every day to day to walk in our identity. And God, I just thank you. I thank you that you're preparing us, Lord God, for this every single day. May you love us that you take that time to go from point A, A.5, B, B.5. God, you're not rushing us through this. God, I just thank you that every single person here is your beloved child. And you love them with an everlasting love. And the word spoken today, God, I just pray, Lord, that they'll be buried deep, Lord. God, as the word of God dwells richly in each and every single one of them, that they will be unmoved, unshaken, and unnerved no matter what happens, Lord God, in this life, that we can expect your goodness, expect the blessings, expect, Lord God, to walk on that path of righteousness because we have been made righteous in Christ Jesus. Nothing, God, nothing contrary to your word matters. So God, we just thank you for that. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word, Lord. Thank you for the confidence and the boldness that you put in each and every one of us as we go forth and declare your goodness, declare your truth, and live Christ-like to this world. God, the world has no idea what's coming for them. They're going to see Christ-likeness everywhere. They're going to see that, God. Hearts are going to be changed. Souls of the Lord are going to be converted. I just thank you that there's a blessing in walking our identity. God, let us be that voice, not an echo. Let us boldly declare your goodness and truth, Lord. As we go out these doors, Lord God, we're back on that mission field. God, thank you that you're energizing, preparing, equipping us for that. We love you, Lord, but you love us even more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm also up here for any prayer and anything like that. So, thank you.